Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Well, what's, is that, that's off now? Okay. Well, thank you very much, and uh, can everybody hear me all right? Is this voice coming through okay? You hear me at the back? Okay. Um, well, I'm very glad to be here. Thank you for coming out. And I think this is a, an important issue for Albertans to consider. Um, as Lila mentioned, there hasn't been any nuclear reactors ordered and built in North America uh, for 30 years. Uh, the last time any nuclear reactor was ordered was 1978. And uh, back east, when, this, when these reactors were built, and also in the United States, there was very little understanding about radioactive waste and about the other problems associated with nuclear power. The decision makers really thought the way I thought when I was in high school. When I was in high school, I thought nuclear energy was great because the only thing I knew about it was that it was clean, safe, cheap, and abundant. And I thought, well, <laughs> who can be against that? Uh, it sounds great. And uh, in a way, I think that what's happening here in Alberta is a little bit of a time warp, uh, because we seem to be back in the 50s again, where nuclear power is once again being presented as if it's this clean, safe uh, alternative, when in fact, uh, lots of experience has shown that uh, problems keep mounting up on the nuclear domain. As a matter of fact, as I've been trying to tell the MLAs here and other people, uh, back east where we have 22 nuclear reactors, they're all in trouble. All of them are suffering from uh, deterioration, uh, which is very severe and which requires uh, very extensive uh, repairs. These repairs cost billions of dollars per plant. For example, in, in Quebec, we have only one operating nuclear reactor. It costs one and a half billion dollars estimated. They haven't even started work on it. But just before they start work, they're saying it's going to cost one and a half billion dollars to repair it. And that figure is already 300 million dollars more than it was three months ago. So uh, you wonder what's happened in the last three months that suddenly boosted the price by 300 million dollars. Uh, once they get into the core of the reactor and start actually doing the work, chances are it's going to cost even more. Because in Ontario, they had four reactors, the Pickering A reactors, you might have heard about them. They're among those reactors that were shut down in 1997, for those of you who remember. Remember there were seven reactors shut down at one shot by the Ontario, uh, the Board of Directors of Ontario Hydro? Well, the, the four Pickering A reactors were among those. And six years later, they wanted to restart them because uh, they were not broken, they were supposed to be okay, so all we have to do is restart them, right? And the estimate was, well, we can restart them, it'll only take about six months to do that, and it'll cost about $800 million, about $200 million each to restart them. Well, a year and a half later, they had managed to get one of those reactors up and running at a cost of $1.5 billion. And uh, at that point, there was an inquiry and uh, they said, this is unacceptable. You've got to do better than that. Let's see if you can get another unit started at a cost of under 500 million, okay? Let's, let's be a little modest here. And uh, they brought another one up. Uh, they got another unit started up again. Again, it took almost a year to get it started, and it cost over a billion dollars. So they managed to get two out of four reactors restarted at a cost of two and a half billion dollars, and they just wrote off the other two. They said, forget it. We're not even going to try. So we don't really know whether these repairs, these, oh, and by the way, those two reactors that were restarted, they're not working very well. It turns out that last summer, when Ontario was really short of power, those reactors were shut down because they're having new problems, additional problems that they somehow, uh, you know, there you go. Uh, what can you say? So uh, we're not at all sure uh, back east whether these reactors are really going to be able to function properly once they are refurbished, even though the refurbishment itself is very expensive. And I've been urging the MLAs here and the politicians to say, look, don't buy uh, a Trojan horse until you see what's inside. You know, so so maybe, you should, uh, maybe you should wait and see whether they're able to get these reactors working back east before you uh, think about anything out here. Now, I'm going to uh, cover a lot of territory tonight, and I apologize in advance. It's a little heavy going, but I'm trying to make it as easily understood as possible. 
And uh, I, I'm trying to pack a lot in because I don't very often get a chance to come out here. And I think that there are many issues that are worth talking about. So I hope that you find it uh, useful. Um, the first, I've, told, I've called this talk nuclear power hope or hoax. Because, of course, nuclear power, there's a big public relations campaign worldwide right now to really talk up the idea of a nuclear renaissance and the idea that somehow this is going to usher in a new era of plenty. Uh, so let's talk about that first. Here we have a graph that was actually put together in 1975. That's when this graph was actually printed. And it was a, a, a graph prepared by Amory Lovins of the Rocky Mountain Institute. Uh, Amory Lovins wrote a book, which is quite, a, a, quite an important book at the time, called Soft Energy Paths. And he's the one who coined the phrase soft energy paths as an alternative to what he called hard energy paths. And what this graphic shows is the projections that were current in the United States at that time. These are US figures for the demand in energy, which just keeps going up and up and up and requiring more and more coal and oil and gas and nuclear in order to desperately try and keep up with this galloping demand. And uh, of course, with the oil and gas gradually being phased out due to uh, shortage of supply, uh, coal and nuclear would be carrying the bulk of the weight there. Now, Amory Levins put forward an alternative vision of what might be possible, which he called soft energy paths. And uh, he goes into great detail about this in his book. And he said that we should be aiming, instead of thinking of success as being the more energy we use, the more successful we are, the more energy we use, the richer we are. On the contrary, the less energy we use to accomplish a given task, the richer we are. It's like saying that if I go, if I go to buy something, the more money I pay for the same item, the richer I am. Well, maybe that's true, but it's pretty foolish. Uh, if you can get the same item for less money, that's efficiency. And that's what energy efficiency is all about. It's not about uh, uh, doing without the conveniences of energy. It's getting the maximum use out of the energy we have. And he was suggesting that we could bring this demand down so that by the year 20, 2025, we'd be having less demand or about the same demand and decreasing as we were having in 1975. And he said, with that goal, you can really use soft technologies, wind, coal, uh, wind uh, uh, solar, and geothermal, et cetera, et cetera, to meet uh, the US energy demands. And oil and gas would be phased out. Coal would also gradually be phased out. And we'd be heading towards a new vision of what our energy future would look like. Now, um, this uh, dot, that yellow dot there, is uh, in 1989. Uh, our, my organization, the Canadian Coalition for Nuclear Responsibility, hosted a conference in Montreal called the Green Energy Conference. And Amory Levins was one of our keynote speakers. And he pointed out that in 1989, in that year, we were actually well within his prediction, which at the time he published it was considered to be completely unrealistic. And so in fact, by 1989, they had already managed to shave off demand. How did this happen? Well, the reason it happened was because in 1973 was the first oil crisis. That's when there was an oil embargo. And people learned that, that they could actually save money by saving energy. And energy conservation did this without a lot of government leadership. There were certain incentive programs, it's true. But most of this just happened because people, by the millions, invested in energy efficiency and brought the demand down. Now, I just recently looked up these figures myself, and I found out that in 2006, you can check this on the internet, the actual demand in the US is still within that curve. So you know, I think we should pat ourselves, uh, this is US figures, but I think we should realize that there's been a lot accomplished, a lot more than we think, in terms of following a different path. 